Hey guys, Mike here from Mercado Airwaves. We want to thank you so much for all the support you've given us here on the network. And if you want to see what we're up to outside of the station, please follow us all over social media. I'm on Twitter at MikeMMedia and on Instagram at MikeMercadoMedia. You can follow the good brother Alex Mercado on Twitter at Mercado21Alex and on Instagram at Mercado2121. The lovely Nicole Mancha is on all social media platforms at Typing When Tipsy. You can follow the network on Twitter at Mercado Airwaves. Our pop culture show, The Good Brothers, on Twitter at Good Brothers Pod. Our true crime shows on Instagram at Murder Mysteries and More. And of course, like us on Facebook at Mercado Airwaves. You can see all our videos on YouTube.com slash Mike Mercado 2333 or by searching Mercado Airwaves Network. We play video games on Twitch, twitch.tv slash Mercado Airwaves Network. And of course, you can support our network by finding a tier just for you, whether you want early access, you want to be part of polls, you want to win content prizes by visiting us at patreon.com slash mercado airwaves and we really appreciate it wherever you get your favorite podcast to like rate review and share us and please spread the word for the good brother alex mercado for the lovely nicole mancha i'm mike mercado thank you so much for all the support you've given us here on the network hello and welcome in friends to another episode of sports from the couch here on the mercado airwaves network i'm your host mike mercado i want to thank you so much for making us a part of your day and we have finally made it to the finale of of our review of The Last Dance, episode 9 and 10. I want to thank you so much for joining us as we finish up our conversation of this amazing 30 for 30 documentary from ESPN. This review is coming up a little bit later than usual. We usually put these up a day or two after the release of the episode, but the lovely Nicole Mancha and I have moved to our new shindigs, and we brought up the new studio, so I am remotely doing this here in the brand new living room as we are building the studio, but thank you guys so much, and let's get into the final two episodes, episode 9 and 10 of The Last Dance. And episode 9 begins with Reggie versus MJ, the Pacers versus the Bulls, the very last Easter Conference Finals for the Chicago Bulls, the Beatles of the 90s, and it was an amazing journey going back to it. So a little bit of a backstory. For a lot of you who have been joining us throughout these entire reviews, which you can listen to any one of our past reviews that we've done of episodes 1 through 8 so far of The Last Dance A lot of the memories I have from the Bulls, especially from the early 90s, are more from pictures and just memories and kind of little recollections of what happened throughout the days and the celebrations and how excited everybody was. But 1998 specifically, I remember a lot of. And I was eight years old by the time we got to this point in the documentary. And I always remember everybody hating the New York Knicks. But for me, the team that I despised, the player I despised the most were the Pacers and Reggie Miller. The rivalry these two teams had. The fact that they were so close to each other. Indianapolis is what, two and a half hours, three hours away from us here in Chicago? And those games were brutal. I remember being a little kid and just every time hearing the Pacers' name, I knew I had to get mad. I used to make fun of Reggie Miller because I thought he looked like an alien. Like he looked like a Martian that you would see in Looney Tunes. I hated the Pacers. But... The documentary finally gives us that that look into it. And it's funny, if you were a fan of sports radio, if you're a fan of all things that have been this documentary, Reggie Miller has been joining Dan Patrick over the last few weeks. And he mentioned how he was a little worried how he was going to come out on this because Michael has basically been trashing everybody. And sure enough, we get Michael on the iPad watching the fight with Reggie Miller and quite frankly looking like he's ready to go again. The man is a psychopath. He's ready to fight Reggie again. And then we see Reggie Miller who just doesn't give a damn. And you know, Reggie goes on this entire story about how when he first came into a league, his he thought the best thing to do was to go after Michael. And he gives Michael a hard fall the first time they play against each other. And Michael goes off and ends up destroying Reggie Miller in that game. And this is when we get the infamous saying, Michael tells Reggie, don't talk trash to black Jesus. And the seeds were born for a great rivalry. And that Pacers team, though, I mean, I can't stress enough for anybody who's younger listening to us here on Mercado Airwaves on Sports from the Couch, the rivalry between the Pacers and the Bulls and how good that Pacers team was. Don't get it twisted about Larry Bird and Reggie Miller and the Davis boys. And that was a really good team. And they continue to get really good with Ron Artest and Jermaine O'Neal. 
the Pacers have always been a really respectable organization, and it started back then, but it, they just ran into that buzzsaw. And that's the one thing that we continue to see in this documentary was the buzzsaw that was Michael Jordan. And he even gives some depth to the Pacers. He Michael mentions it himself that they were the toughest out. Not necessarily, other than Detroit, the Pacers were the tough out. Not the New York Knicks, not the Miami Heat, not the Charlotte Hornets. And it's one thing for Michael Jordan to talk trash about any of these other players, right? But the respect he gives to Indianapolis is really interesting. The respect he gives to the Pacers and to Reggie. I wonder how much of it had to do with when we, they were filming. They had the director on on some of these shows, and he mentioned that Reggie's part and the Pacers part, Michael didn't get to see on the iPad because Michael was filmed way before a lot of these things. So I think it's really interesting to see how that played out. But one thing I really wanted to get into is how so many of you sleep on Reggie Miller. Reggie Miller was a bad dude. I would love to see what Reggie Miller can do in today's game. The idea of Reggie Miller playing with somebody like LeBron James, unbelievable. Reggie Miller was good. He didn't give a damn. He was going to annoy you. He was going to antagonize you. And he was going to show you how good he was. Now, Reggie Miller was never an MVP. Reggie Miller was never the best player in the league. All those things are true and they're all fair. Reggie Miller was one of the most dangerous players in the National Basketball Association, especially in the 90s. One of the smarter players in the NBA. And we just continuously to see that he, he was special and he wanted to take the last shot. And we get that great scene, though, of the Pacers getting that lead and Reggie Miller hitting a big shot and Michael Jordan almost hitting a game, a crazy game winner in game four. And it just goes to show how special that series was. I think that's the one thing the Pacers and the Bulls had it going seven games. It was probably the most special series of the modern day Bulls run. Obviously, everything went through with the Detroit Pistons and getting their first championship. There's a lot of great subtext and a lot of great text of the story. But the nuance that was that seven-game series and the little stuff of Reggie Miller hitting a big shot, Michael almost hitting a buzzer beater. They were close games. Really good stuff, and I'm so glad that they really highlighted the Indiana Pacers in the beginning of this episode. But then we get a time lapse back to 1997, and we start to get the perspective of the Utah Jazz. And even Michael finally talks about Carl Malone's MVP. And it's funny because the Carl Malone MVP is the basic starting point for most conversations when it comes to the MVP. Carl Malone, Charles Barkley, Derrick Rose, Russell Westbrook, James Harden. All these guys win MVPs during the time of the greatest player of their era being playing at the same time. You know, Michael Jordan could have won the MVP any given year. LeBron James could win the MVP any given year. But some other guys have great individual seasons. And Michael brings up the fact that it did motivate him that he wasn't the MVP of the league. But he does also make it known that Kyle Malone is a bad dude when it comes to being on the court and probably outside the court. That's a different conversation for a different day. Do your research, kids. But there is no doubt Kyle Malone was a baller in the NBA, and he deserved that MVP, and I really don't like when we have conversations of people not deserving MVPs, and that we only give certain guys them because we're bored of the other player, you can make an argument any year that, yeah, LeBron deserves the MVP, yeah, because he's a great player, don't you want to recognize other great players, don't you want to help other great players get money and get sponsorship, I think it's very narrow-minded whenever we say only this person should be the MVP. And poor Carl Malone was going to pay the price for it if Michael was concerned. We also get to hear a lot about Brian Russell. And this is the funny story of just how psychotic Michael is. So I guess long story short is Brian Russell is basically talking trash to Michael Jordan saying, why did you retire? Why did you retire? You knew I could guard you. You knew I could guard you. I would have got your ass. Who does that? First of all, who bothers another man like that when they're in retirement? My counter also is, there's a good chance Michael made up some of this stuff. We've we've heard so many people, and we'll get into it a little bit, but we hear so many people post the last dance talking about Michael Jordan and who, how they feel about all this and who they really think he is. And 
poor Brian Russell, though. I, I feel bad for him, and we didn't hear from him in, in this documentary. That's the interesting thing, too. We didn't hear from Brian Russell. We didn't hear from Carl Malone. We don't hear anything about the Houston Rockets. Very interesting stuff. And we go full circle with Michael hitting the game one winner over Brian Russell. And Russell better get used to that. Uh, how, and that's the other thing, too, about Michael Jordan. Is, you know, a lot of people never believe in divine intervention when it comes to sports. Right? Like, God doesn't care about who wins the big game, who does this, who does that. Right? Obviously. Makes the most sense. But, man, if there isn't some weird serendipity in the universe when it comes to Michael Jordan. And maybe a lot of it is because he made it up and to fit the narrative. But the fact that Brian Russell's talking all this trash about him, or supposedly talking all this trash to him, and Michael gets his ass back a few different times. <laughs> Finally, though, for so many fans, we touch the subject of the quote-unquote flu game. So this entire series, we've been talking about Michael overcoming the odds, Michael making his own odds, making up stories. Because he's psychotic. And then we get to the most famous Michael Jordan story. The flu game. So here in Chicago, there's always been a lot of different reports about what really happened that night in Utah. And in the last dance, Michael finally tells us his version of the story along with the trainers and some of his security. And the story is, he was poisoned. That it wasn't a flu. It was Food poisoning. And how did he get said food poisoning? From Utah Pizza. That's right. Michael Jordan tells us the story that the famous flu game was from a pizza that was delivered from five guys. Not the great restaurant. Three guys. Three guys here in Chicago. But by five guys helped deliver this pizza. And of course, Michael was the only one who ate it. And the old urban legend is because Michael is just a psychopath that he spit on the pizza so that nobody else would have it. The man's worth how many billions and he can't afford to split a pizza. That's a different conversation for a different day. But he's quote unquote poisoned. And oh, he does nothing special but goes for 38 points in 44 minutes in a Bulls win. But all this time has come since this release, this premiere of episodes 9 and 10. And one of the things that's being disputed is whether or not he was hungover, whether it was food poisoning, whether it was a flu game, was it altitude uh, poisoning or deprivation or whatever the hell it is. So many different rumors. But a lot of people say this isn't the story. I guess my question is, if it's a lie, this is a very lame one. And if it's the truth, the lie was better. You know, food poisoning doesn't sound as good as the flu game. But man, they made a lot of money out of the flu game. And I don't know why he decided to attack that now. You know, I would think if you're Michael and you enjoy embellishing the story and and definitely making the lore it what it is, that he would definitely have stuck with it was the flu. But at least as the documentary is concerned, it was food poisoning from bad pizza in Utah. There's also been a lot of stories about different people getting food poisoning in Utah around the NBA, but some people will disagree with Michael's sake. Let me know what you guys think, though, on the comment section below after you guys watch this entire series. And something that was a little shocking besides the fact that Michael might have been sabotaged with poison pizza, he finally gives some credit to some teammates. And we get to the Steve Kerr part of the documentary. And it's interesting because for a long time, everybody was kind of wondering why were they promoting Steve Kerr so much, besides the fact that he's kind of the guy that the young generation can attach themselves to because he's the coach of Steph Curry and the Golden State Warriors. But damn, his story was definitely needed and was definitely a highlight of this entire series. First, we start off with the very basic Pax and Kerr comp. And taking aside for a second the documentary, obviously as a pundit of the Chicago Bulls of the NBA. I really wish it worked out better for John Paxson and the Bulls organization. It seems like he knows so much about basketball because he does. That is a truth that you hear around the inner circles. He's very knowledgeable when it comes to stuff in the NBA. 
it just didn't work out, and it's a shame. But man, he was a good player. He's been a lifer. He helped win championships. And it's just, it's unfortunate that it did not work out for John Paxson. With all that out of the way, though, we get past the basketball part of this story. And Steve Kerr lets us into what happened to his father. Now, for a lot of people, this was an old story. And I always knew something happened to Steve Kerr's father. I always knew it was one of the main reasons he was very active when it came to gun violence. But I really never dug deep into hearing what that story was. And it's a very tragic story. In 1984, his dad was killed. And it was the first time in this documentary I was emotionally invested in it. I actually shed a tear. You could see the pain still in Steve Kerr. You could still see the pain in his family. And it, it was really, really something else to see such a a stoic person, such an articulate person, just break down like that. And it all, it's so needless see. And you can also see how much they care and they see the recklessness around them. So I give big kudos to Steve Kerr. Telling us that story and being about it, you know? And I also, we, we saw some some footage of the rally after Steve Kerr hits the big game winner for the Bulls to win number five. You know, he hits that big shot, the Bulls win number five. This big moment for Steve Kerr. And what I love about this documentary is they do ask the big question. Steve Kerr, your father was shot and killed. Political assassination. Michael, your father was killed armed robbery, killed for his possession, left there to die. And they never talked about it. They never once bonded over it. But I think both of them bonded over one thing. They lost themselves in basketball. Because that's one thing Steve Kerr mentioned is that he just lost himself in Arizona basketball to be as good as he could be when he got to the Cleveland Cavaliers, started his road in being a professional in the NBA. And I thought it was really fascinating. You know, we, we know the history and the drama between Steve Kerr and Michael Jordan. And all these, the lore, the NBA lore that has come from these two in, in the practice gym. And the fact that they never bonded over this moment. But they almost didn't need to. At least it seemed that way, listening to both of them. And I would love to talk to both of them privately and really get to know why they didn't talk to each other. Would it have made a difference? Would they have been closer? Would it have driven them apart? Would Michael have embraced it? Would Steve have embraced it? Very fascinating stuff. And like I said, we get awesome footage of the rally. Something that I remember from that summer of just the party of the Chicago Bulls. And how you know I've been really lucky to see two of the three Blackhawks rallies live and a Chicago Cubs World Series. But we move back to Game 7 of the 98 Eastern Conference Finals. And it's the end of an era kind of talk. They're just talking about this is the last ride. And we really get to know a little bit about Michael Jordan again. And speaking of, you know, father figures, we get to know Gus, the security guard, who was a former CPD. And how important Michael's security entourage was. And how Gus got lung cancer and Michael really took care of him. And Gus even came back for game seven of the Eastern Conference Finals to cheer on the Bulls. And Michael and Gus were so tight that he would call Gus crying after the death of his father. And that's the moment. Those are the type of stuff where you knew Michael was just on a different level. He was not going to lose in front of that guy. And that Michael was human. That he did have relationships. And again, speaking of full circle, Steve Kerr hits a big three. The Bulls go off on a big run and win game seven. They go on and they go for their final championship. And we leave episode nine with Michael being the jerk that he is. And that is being an asshole to Larry Bird. And with the Pacers out of the way, we get our rematch of Bulls versus The Jazz in the 1998 NBA Finals. 
And my favorite part about episode 10 starting off after they hype up Bulls versus Jazz is we finally get to see Michael's kids. Michael's kids. That's right. If you didn't know, he had a family because we sure as hell haven't seen them in this documentary. Marcus, Jeffrey, and of course his daughter. Some uh, funny stuff to see them, especially post Hall of Fame speech. And a funny story really fast. Not necessarily a funny story, but a story really fast. Michael was at our high school. Elk Grove High School here in Illinois, his son, I forget if it was Marcus or Jeffrey, whichever one is around my age, was playing for Loyola Academy, and they came and played the Elk Grove varsity team, and Michael was here in our school, he was hiding out in the wrestling balcony, but just a, a little six degrees of separation with Michael Jordan, but... You know, it's funny, they mentioned throughout it the emotions because they're the same age as I am. And it's, this Bulls team is so far reaching. But for me personally, like why I have so many fond memories of it, it's because I was eight years old when this happened. And I remember how much I hated the Utah Jazz. They were the bad guys. You know, I remember rooting for Dennis Rodman in the NWO 444 life because Carl Malone was with Diamond Dallas Page. There was a huge, huge problem with with the Jazz in my heart of hearts. And I love that Jordan's kids brought that up. But damn, the Jazz won a great game in overtime. And I love Michael's quote, though, talking about, I ain't Shaq. I ain't Shaq. You know why I love that, though? I love that he threw a little shade to Shaquille O'Neal because Shaq throws so much shade towards Charles Barkley. And I know some people say it's a joke and that I take it too personally, but it's like, you know, know your audience, and I'm so glad, because what's Shaq going to say about Jordan? Oh, we would have beaten the Bulls. Me and Kobe, we would have beaten them. Yeah, yeah. Go ahead and say that in Michael's face, though. Bet you won't. But again, a very tough series, and, you know, I, I love that we get in Game 3. It's a tough series. Every game is close. Down to the wire, overtime, last possession. Michael doesn't hit the big shot if it's not a close game, right? Except for one game. When the Bulls win 96-54 to in an NBA Finals game. Unbelievable. And I want to get into this because we saw some footage of the late, great Jerry Sloan. That's right, I have to say late. Unfortunately, Bulls Hall of Famer. Retired number in the rafters of the United Center. One of the greatest coaches of all time, Jerry Sloan has passed away over the last few days as we're recording this. And I want to just take this time because in my notes, as I was writing this last Sunday, I just wrote, I love Jerry Sloan. He was funny, true gentleman, true legend. The fact that he got the Bulls to the Western Conference Finals, even though they lost the Golden State Warriors back in the 70s. One of the greatest Bulls of all time. Probably the best Bull before Michael showed up. And just a stalwart of the NBA. And it sucks that we lost him, and it sucks that he was so ill and that a lot of us didn't know unless you were part of the inner circle but you know our thoughts prayers and love to jerry sloan thank you for the memories thank you for the contribution to the game of basketball and you know a chicago bull forever and an nba pioneer slash legend jerry sloan now there's no easy transition but we move on and we get damn dennis just keep doing his thing as dennis rodman Misses practice straight up ditches for WCW. Like I mentioned, this entire storyline, we knew how bonkers he was already. But Dennis just straight up not showing up to practice. And then the best part is they kind of just, Phil acknowledges it. Everybody knows he screws up. And yet they still find a way to go up 3-1 as if nothing happened. Like that's how good this, this team was. There's, one of their star players would just disappear. No problem. Go do chair shots and Monday Night Nitro. And then come back and they still go up 3-1 in the NBA Finals. Although they will, they would lose Game 5. But finally, this documentary, it's all led to this. At least that was what the initial hype was. We get to what is the last game of the last dance of this Bulls team. It is Game 6 and the story behind it. These are things that I didn't realize. You know, being a Bulls fan, being eight years old when this is happening, these guys are superheroes. These guys are rock stars. You don't know, though, the nuance in the storytelling that's going on and the big, the big moments. 
and that being Scottie Pippen was really hurt. His back was just messed up. Dennis was going off the hinges. We knew Phil didn't want him to come back because of his relationship with Jerry Krause. Scotty wanted to get paid. Michael was over being a rock star. You know, when you start hearing these things, and I know a lot of people keep saying they could have won number seven in 1999, or they would have won eight straight if Michael didn't retire. Before we get into what is the final moments of game six of the 98 finals, maybe now is the time to really just hit this moment. Before we get to this time and place in history where Michael makes what would be the shot, this Bulls team was running on fumes. This Bulls team, while still good, was not a for sure thing to go on and win it the next year. Scotty wasn't coming back. Michael would cut his finger. Dennis only had 20 more games in the NBA. This team was changing. And you probably could have done something with Tony Kukoc. And maybe if you land a Tracy McGrady or a Tim Duncan, you somehow find your way into that scenario. Things might be a little different. But the big thing is Michael saying he feels robbed that he didn't get a chance to go for number seven. That he thinks they could have won it. At the very least, let us go out on our shield. He's saying that now. And that's easy to say with over 20 years of hindsight. But when you hear every reporter, you hear every author, you see every interview, you read every article, Michael was done. He wanted out. So now he's talking about how they could have done another run. Or he could have felt better after this and it was a lockout. But when you're living in that moment, he didn't want any part of that. And yes, you can blame Jerry Krause all you want for always pushing that. But I, I think it's a, a really big mistake for Bulls fans and for NBA fans to not take that with a grain of salt when Michael says they would have won number seven. He would have came back on a one-year deal. Everybody would have came back. It, really? Yeah, you're saying that now as a 50-something-year-old man in 2020. Were you saying that in 1998? You weren't because we have the proof. We have the articles. We've read the stories. And I think that's one of the things I've come with at the end of this entire documentary. Which was really weird because I didn't think that would be the case. But we finally get to the moment. And we live during the game. Jordan scores. Then Jordan goes down the court, steals the ball, comes back down, and hits the shot over Brian Russell, 87 86 Bulls win title number six and we get a great scenery of Grant Park for the NBA championship rally and my little heart grew six sizes that day because it 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 just brings back how much this city loves a champion and how these guys are rock stars and something that's even more unique than what is a once in a lifetime dynasty like the Bulls Jerry Krause gets some credit from some of these guys, including Scottie Pippen, Michael Jordan. They all mention it. It's like he was the architect of this team. I think that's the complicated issue throughout this entire thing with Jerry Krause. Besides the fact that he wasn't around to defend himself and to explain himself, Jerry Krause was the architect of this thing. He was the the mind behind all the money. He was the guy that brought in Phil Jackson. He's the guy that scouted Scottie Pippen. Jerry Krause deserves a lot of credit. Does he deserve as much credit as he wanted? No. Does he deserve more credit than he gets? Yes. Was he surly? Yes. Was he kind of a dick? Yes. Did he open his mouth at the wrong time sometimes? Absolutely. He was still a great NBA executive. They made a lot of money. They won a lot of games. It's hard to replicate one of the greatest teams of all time and the greatest player of all time. And if you're not very likable, then yes, a lot is going to fall on you. And I think that's what happened to Jerry Krause. But you have to give them as much credit, and they do. They finally gave Jerry some credit. Then we start winding this bad boy down. 
And one of the stories that we hear is from Phil Jackson talking about what the team wrote letters, almost like a bonfire, ayahuasca type of thing. And Michael wrote a poem. And apparently it was one of these things that like shut the room down type of moments. And a lot of emotion was being said between these guys. And this is a quote that stuck with us. And Chicagoans have are going to ride and die with this forever. It'll be on every chest tattoo, on every Facebook cover you could find. My heart, my love, my soul belong in the city of Chicago. And a great kind of quote to end that off. We start winding it down with Jerry Ryan's door talking about how he offered Phil to come back. Phil said no. Get some machismo. MJ hears what Reinsdorf has to say, and he basically calls BS on it. And this is why a lot of people don't like Jerry Reinsdorf, or at the very least have a bad taste in their mouth with Jerry about this specific scenario. Jerry was very hands-off. You know, he mentions all this time about money, this, this, and that. A lot of these guys weren't making a lot of money, especially like they are in today's NBA. So I, I could go on and on. I've done it before on the network. If there's anybody who deserves so much of the blame of this dynasty breaking down and has basically gone unscathed, it is Jerry Reinsdorf. And if you don't believe me, just look at the way Jordan reacts when not only he hears the name of Jerry Reinsdorf, but when he hears what Jerry has to say. And with that in mind, we get our final scene of Michael Jordan walking out, giving us the final lines of the episode. And we conclude the last dance, ESPN's 30 for 30, about the 1998 Chicago Bulls and Michael Jordan. Wow, what a ride it was, my friends. I want to talk about a couple things before we head out since the release of this episode. One of them is stuff that was missing. We didn't see anything that to deal with the Houston Rockets. There was a lot of stuff that was kind of left off. One of the great quotes I've heard about what is this documentary is, whenever you see those movies on television or at, at the actual movie theater of based on a true story, That's what this is, kind of. This is a very good telling of the 98 Chicago Bulls about Michael Jordan and his career. But it's a based-on type of story. Michael had a lot of control over this. Michael's team had a lot of control over this. And it shows. It definitely isn't always the most flattering to Michael Jordan. But, to my next point, he buried a lot of people in this documentary. A lot of teammates. And boy, oh boy, if you did not hear what Horace Grant had to say about Michael Jordan, go out of your way to do it. He was on with Cap and Company here in Chicago on ESPN 1000 and basically says Michael is to snitch. Michael is to blame and basically calls Michael out on his BS. And there's also sources saying that Scottie Pippen is not happy with the way he was portrayed in this documentary. Now, when it comes to Horace Grant, Horace, I thought, was great in this documentary. Now, there's always been some kind of weird beef brewing between Horace Grant and Michael Jordan. I always thought it had to deal with Michael being crazy and Horace going to Orlando. But now we're starting to see that they just did not groove like that. That they were adversaries, especially for being teammates. And I think a lot of people were willing to give the cheese mate up on Jordan. I think a lot of people wanted to bring him down a pedestal or two. So I don't think he was the only source. He was the snitch, as Jordan said. And Scotty, when it comes to Scotty, that's his own doing, right? Like he had a chance to walk it back, and he doubled down on it on the documentary. Nobody forced him to say that. Now, is it a little bogus that Michael left all that in? Probably. But Scotty should know better. So I don't necessarily feel bad for Scotty in this case. He did all those things. He put himself in that situation. And it kind of just didn't work out for him. But there's definitely been a huge fallout of this documentary. And it seems like it is not slowing down anytime soon. So make sure you stay tuned with us here on Sports from the Couch on the Mercado Airwaves Network. As we continue our conversation of 
The Last Dance. But that'll do it for us here on our review of ESPN's 30 for 30 of the Chicago Bulls and Michael Jordan. Make sure you guys check out the archives if you missed any one of our other reviews. Wherever you get your favorite podcast at Mercado Airwaves, please like, rate, review, and share us. It really helps us grow the brand. I'm on Twitter at Mike M Media and on Instagram at Mike Mercado Media. Like us on Facebook at Mercado Airwaves. Subscribe to us on YouTube, youtube.com slash Mercado Airwaves Network. Play video games with us on Twitch, twitch.tv slash Mercado Airwaves Network. Visit us at patreon.com slash Mercado Airwaves Network. If you would like to hear our interviews ad-free and before anybody else with athletes and celebrities, exclusively at patreon.com slash Mercado Airwaves. For everybody here, thank you so much for joining us as we broke down every single episode of ESPN's 30 for 30, The Last Dance, the story of Michael Jordan and the Chicago Bulls. Let us know your thoughts on how you enjoyed the series. What were your final thoughts? What did you think the documentary missed? Does the documentary have a chance for Academy Award gold? We'll have to wait and see on that. But until then, take care of each other. Enjoy the rest of your day. We'll see you next time here on Sports from the Couch on the Mercado Airwaves Network. I'm Mike Mercado. Hey guys, Mike here from Mercado Airwaves. We want to thank you so much for all the support you've given us here on the network. And if you want to see what we're up to outside of the station, please follow us all over social media. I'm on Twitter at Mike M Media and on Instagram at Mike Mercado Media. You can follow the good brother Alex Mercado on Twitter at Mercado21 Alex and on Instagram at Mercado2121. The lovely Nicole Mancha is on all social media platforms at Typing When Tipsy. You can follow the network on Twitter at Mercado Airwaves. Our pop culture show, The Good Brothers, on Twitter at Good Brothers Pod. Our true crime shows on Instagram at Murder Mysteries and More. And of course, like us on Facebook at Mercado Airwaves. You can see all our videos on YouTube.com slash Mike Mercado 2333 or by searching Mercado Airwaves Network. We play video games on Twitch, twitch.tv slash Mercado Airwaves Network. And of course, you could support our network by finding a tier just for you, whether you want early access, you want to be part of polls, you want to win content prizes by visiting us at patreon.com slash mercado airwaves and we really appreciate it wherever you get your favorite podcast to like rate review and share us and please spread the word for the good brother alex mercado for the lovely nicole mancha i'm mike mercado thank you so much for all the support you've given us here on the network